A lot of basketball talk on today's episode of the Locked On Louisville podcast from discussing the open scholarship distribution for the men's basketball team, Jalen Withers entering the portal, and the women's basketball team clinching a spot in this upcoming weekend's Sweet 16. There's a lot of stuff to talk about, like I said. So with that being said, let's get right on into it. You are Locked On Louisville, your daily podcast on the Louisville Cardinals. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, what's going on, everyone? Welcome into another episode of the Locked On Louisville Podcast. I'm your host, Dalton Pence. I serve as a credential media member for Cardinal Sports Zone. Also do some PA announcing work for the university and various sports. Want to take this time to thank you all for making us your first listen of the day. Just a reminder, the Locked On Louisville Podcast is free on all streaming services, five days a week, your team every day. Like I mentioned, a lot of basketball talk on today's episode of the show. We're going to discuss how the Louisville men's basketball program should fill the um, three open scholarships that the program has in terms of positional needs, so on and so forth. We'll talk about what Jalen Withers entering the portal means for the team next season. And then to conclude the show, we'll talk about the women's basketball team absolutely demolishing Texas on the road at the Moody Center. 73-51 73-51 to 51 in the round of 32. The Cardinals clinching their spot in Friday evening's Sweet 16 matchup against Mississippi. So we will talk about that at the conclusion of the show. To begin, we'll start out with the current state of scholarship distribution for the Louisville men's basketball program. Last Friday, when Trenton Flowers committed and Roosevelt Wheeler entered the transfer portal, the team had two open spots. Now with the news of Jalen Withers transferring, by my calculations, we are at three open scholarships available for next season for Louisville. Um, I've heard a lot of people ask about Hersey Miller. I think he's on scholarship next season, or I'm sorry, this season. But when it comes to if he's going to be on scholarship next season, from a lot of articles about the scholarship distribution for next year, it doesn't seem like um, many believe that he's going to be. So I think that that's one thing that needs to be confirmed one way or the other. Um, but I'm going to operate as if he's not going to be, but could definitely be wrong because I truly don't know. Um, another thing to focus on, and I'm not saying he's going to or not, But if L. Ellis were to come back, does he count against an open scholarship with him taking that COVID year? Does that account for one of the scholarships? That's something to focus on as well because I'm honestly not sure. I've seen some people say one thing. I've seen some people say the other thing. So if you know for certain, drop the knowledge down in the comments. Um, You know, enlighten me on on how that works. But – You know, I think L. Ellis is 50-50. If you made me take a guess, I mean, I think he – if you made me take a guess, I would probably say he's not back next season. But truly, I have no inside information. So, um, ultimately, you know, who knows, right? But looking at where the Cardinals sit, they are at 10 field scholarships. I'm I'm going to read you the scholarships by position and how it – Um, relates to how the Cardinals need to fill the positions moving forward. At guards, we have Sky Clark and Mike James. At the wing position, Caleb Glenn, J.J. Trainer, Karan Davis, Curtis Williams Jr., Trenton Flowers. Um, And at the bigs position, um, Brandon Huntley-Hatfield, Dennis Evans, and Emmanuel Okorafor. So you're sitting at 10 players, right? So that begs the question... How should Kenny Payne and company fill out the remainder of the roster? Well, I am not opposed to going with the best player available approach because I still think that if you were to go out and get three extremely solid players regardless of position, that you could spin it very positively for the Louisville men's basketball program, obviously. Um, But I think now with the additions of Dennis Evans and Trenton Flowers and Sky Clark, um, that all three project to make some type of an impact next season. Now, granted, it's kind of up in the air as to how much of an impact. I think, you know, obviously I mentioned last week that I think Sky Clark is going to be a starter for the Cardinals at guard. Uh, but Dennis Evans and Trenton Flowers. Now, I, I made a point a couple times that we need to monitor the expectations or kind of 
keep them realistic when discussing the expectations for true freshmen. What I did not mean was that these players couldn't be great next season. I'm not saying that. I'm not naive enough to know that freshmen uh, make solid impacts at the collegiate basketball level. We see many five-star players do that, and Louisville added two five-stars in Dennis Evans and Trenton Flowers. Could Evans and Flowers make some big-time contributions next season? Hell yeah, they can. I'm not saying they can't, but I'm also trying to stay realistic because as much as we've seen five stars and other true freshmen ball out, we've also seen other five stars and true freshmen take a little bit longer to get acclimated to the collegiate game, take a little bit longer to develop. Um, We know that Dennis Evans needs to develop a little bit more offensively. I think Trenton Flowers is one of the most talented prospects that Louisville has gotten committed in the past decade or so. Um, He's that good, but who knows if he's going to be ready out of the gate. That is something to focus on. So when I said we need to manage expectations, I wasn't necessarily saying that I don't believe that either of these two players are going to be good. Or I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm not saying that I don't believe. Yeah, I I said that right the first time. I'm saying that at the end of the day, there's a lot of risk involved if you're, you know, focusing on two true freshmen to, you know, be starters next season. I'm not saying that anyone's suggesting that, but I am offering the suggestion to at least, hey, let's see how they uh, progress early on, and then we'll talk about expectations after the first couple of games. But I don't want to put unrealistic expectations um, too high nor too low, but I I think that both play a solid role on next year's team. So you look at the players that are ready to compete, obviously Sky Clark, Mike James, um, J.J. Trainer, Trenton Flowers, um, Brandon huntley Hadfield, Dennis Evans, Emmanuel Okorafor. I think that Caleb Glenn and Curtis Williams are very talented and could definitely play a um, you know, role in next year's team, but I would expect them to be long-term pieces, and I'm not necessarily sure what to expect of Karan Davis. Um, simply put, I haven't seen much on him, haven't seen much film, so... I don't feel comfortable suggesting one way or the other. Had some solid statistics Juco-wise, but regardless, hard to tell. I think that what Lowell needs to do is they need to go after two starting caliber guards and a starting caliber center. Now, does that mean that those three players start? Perhaps not, but I think you have to go get three starting caliber players, two guards, one center. You look at the center position. uh, We'll talk about it a little bit more in the next segment. Right now, you're at Brandon Huntley Hatfield and Dennis Evans and Emmanuel Okorafor as the starting big men. Um, And Emmanuel Okorafor and Brandon Huntley Hatfield project more of as fours than fives, and Dennis Evans will be a true freshman. So I think a guy like John Hughley from Pittsburgh would be a fantastic fit for Louisville. Um, But I think going out and getting a starting level uh, center, at the very least a a productive veteran big man that has played either at the Power Five or mid major and has been very successful that can come in and provide solid, um, you know, minutes right away um, for the Cardinals. I think would be huge guard wise. People say, "Oh well, we have wings that can dribble the basketball and that can initiate offense." Perhaps, but um, there's one thing in common of the teams in the Sweet 16 this year, and is and that is that they have very good guard play. Um, Isaiah Wong and Nigel Pack from Miami. Um, you know, you see solid guard play uh, across the country. Uh, Marquise Noel from Kansas State. Um, continuing on along, Jamal Shedd and um, um, Vassar from, um, from Houston. So, I mean, they have a, a ton of solid players um, across the country at the guard position that are are going to be very, very solid. Um, Actually, is that – I don't think that's his name. Um, You have Jamal Shedd and – why am I – Sasser, not Vassar. I'm thinking – no, I'm thinking of Devin Vassell from a couple years ago. Uh, The Vassell, Vassar, um, Marcus Sasser um, from – Houston so solid guard play I think guard play is going to be able to unlock um, you know solid wing play as well I think the Cardinals need to add two uh, productive level guards in the portal both that can 
one at least that can initiate offense that can serve as the primary lead guard along with Sky Clark and another, you know, both of them that can score the basketball solidly, shoot the ball well from behind the arc. Um, three open scholarships, so you had to be pretty selective. You've uh, gotten three players with high upside. Now it's time to go get three players with proven college production. And um, I'm definitely excited to see um, who Kenny Payne and company go out and get. But in my opinion, two solid um, collegiate transfer guards and one um, production ready starting caliber big man for the Cardinals next season. And if they were able to get all three, you're looking at, at a very solid roster ahead of next season. So, um, with the uh, like I said, there's a need for a starting big man or a starting caliber big man because Jalen Withers has entered the portal. We'll talk about what that means for the Cardinals. As a whole, here in just a second after we talk about our friends and um, one of the greatest opportunities out there at FanDuel. The tournament is heating up. We're close to the second weekend now, and it's the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook, because new customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. A lot of uh, premier Uh, exclusive specific bets that you can choose from how many three-pointers early on to who's going to make the first basket in a game. Be sure to check out all those bets from player props, spread, money lines, so on and so forth. Um, Don't miss the chance to get your no-sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. All right, so heading on into the second segment of the show, we talked about Jalen Withers, or we mentioned that Jalen Withers is now in the portal for the Louisville Cardinals after spending the past handful of seasons in the Cardinals program um, with the program for four years, but has played for three, um, started 64 of the 81 games that he appeared in, redshirted his first season, six foot nine, native of Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, this is a move that it sucks to hear about because everyone wanted Jalen to succeed, but it's not necessarily unexpected, right? I mean, um, Withers hadn't necessarily gotten better since his redshirt freshman season where he averaged 10.1 points per game, 7.7 rebounds, um, shot the ball 38% from behind the arc, um, 55% from the field. So, you know, a lot of people had high hopes for Jalen Withers over the next season or two. And for whatever reason, whether it was coaching, whether it was just, um, you know, a delay in development on the court, uh, you know, whatever it was, um, Jalen Withers didn't get better. From his first season, for one reason or the other, I'm not blaming him, you know, entirely. I'm not blaming the coaching staff entirely. I think it's probably a mixture of, of you know, development not necessarily going to the way it's planned, and obviously coaching as well, coaching changes, so on and so forth. Um, as a sophomore, really took a step back, um, saw a decrease in minutes from 26 to 18, averaged 5.8 points per game. Shot the ball 41% from the field, 23% from three-point line. He got a little bit of that uh, production back, um, nine points per game. Started 29 of the 32 games he appeared in, 43% from the field, a career-high 41.7% from the three-point line on three attempts, and a career-high 73.5% from the free-throw line. But um, still... Not necessarily to the form of the redshirt freshman season. Um, He had a handful of very, very solid games this year. First game of the year had 17 against Bellarmine, 15 against Wright State, uh, 12 against Miami, 10 against Western Kentucky, um, 16 and 7 against Boston College, 19 and 13, his best game of the season against uh, Georgia Tech in the win back on February 1st. But still, um, this isn't a move that is going to surprise a lot of Louisville fans. I know that there was some possibilities. There were some thoughts that he may come back. Um, But I think that if you were to ask me, actually you did in the mailbag of which of the players between Mike James, Kamari Lands, JJ Trainer, 
Brandon Huntley Hatfield and Jalen Withers were most likely to come back and which were most likely to leave. The three that I said were most likely to come back were Brandon Huntley Hatfield, Mike James, and J.J. Trainer And Kamari Lance and Jalen Withers are both in the transfer portal. So what does this mean for the Louisville Cardinals next season? Well, like I mentioned in the first segment, there is a clear need for another productive player in the front court. Um, I am not saying that Dennis Evans couldn't be solid next year, but you're probably it's probably not uh, wise to go into the um, to the season right away and expect something from a true freshman. Uh, you know, starting caliber minutes, things of the nature, um, because you know you don't see a lot of true freshman big men come in right away and um, you'll be able to produce um, immediately. So, but I'm not saying he can't, I'm just saying um, it's a risk. And unfortunately after coming off of a four win season, it is very critical that Louisville shows some significant improvement next season. And the best way to do that, in my opinion, when it comes to filling in these last three spots, one of the ways is by addressing the need in the front court. Now, Who's to say that Emmanuel Accor for Brandon Hulley Hatfield couldn't play the five? I think that BHH is better suited for the four where he can space the floor out. So I think you're probably looking more so along the lines of, um, you know, maybe J.J. Trainer at the small ball five as he played early on in his career. But I think more, more so now he's kind of transitioned to that wing position. And I think that better suits him for his playing style as a slasher, as a three-point shooter as well, a defender on ball defending wings. Um, so you're looking at Emmanuel Okorafor, who at 6'9", has a solid wingspan that can you know compensate for that lack of height. And then you have a 7'1", center in Dennis Evans, who's going to be able to contribute right away as a rim protector. But offensively speaking, it's hard to project what he's going to be able to bring to the table right away. So I think it's smart to go out to get a guy that um, can fill a couple of needs. Number one, solid on-ball defense around the rim. That was one of the big situations last, or one of the big concerns last year was defense as a whole. One of the the ways is on-ball defense at the rim. Now, Dennis Evans is going to be a breath of fresh air in that category, but you need to continue to add players that can still defend um, at the high post. Uh, Solid rebounder as well and a player that can score around the basket. Um, This past season, Louisville didn't get a ton of production around the rim. That was kind of set aside for players like Sidney Curry, uh, like Roosevelt Wheeler, and both averaged under seven points per game. Just not a consistent threat around the rim. Um, Not a consistent threat in the pick and roll as well. Now, um, it will depend on guard play as well when it comes to the pick and roll situation. But at the end of the day, I think that um, Jalen Withers entering the portal, it's not surprising, although it does suck a little bit because we wish that Jalen Withers would have been uh, great here. Um, But nonetheless, wish him the best of luck in his future endeavors. Wish him the best of luck at his next stop and hope that he has a great end to his collegiate career wherever he ends up. Um, But like I said, I think the you know the losses of Sidney Curry, Roosevelt Wheeler, and now Jalen Withers. Um, you know, you add in a player like Dennis Evans, and that's really the only wing that you're. I'm sorry, the big man that you're adding in currently. So I think that it would be smart for the program to add in another uh, starting caliber level big man to this um, you know to this front court. So very very excited to see what direction Kenny Payne and company go in. But nonetheless, um, we will see how things go. But we're going to switch gears a little bit, head into the women's basketball segment of the show. The Cardinals defeated the Texas Longhorns on the road in the Moody Center in the round of 32. We'll talk about that here in just a second. Before we do that, I want to say thank you all again for making us your first listen of the day. Just a reminder, the Locked on the Louisville podcast is free on all streaming services. Five days a week, your team, every day. What a great time to have the best and most complete performance of the season. That's exactly what happened for Jeff Walls' Louisville Cardinals on the road playing at Texas against the fourth-seeded Texas Longhorns in the Seattle Regional. Um, The round of 32 matchup is or was a rematch 
of an earlier matchup in the Bahamas, I'm sorry, in Atlantis, early on in the season in which the Cardinals won 71-63. to Well, in this matchup, the Cardinals coming in uh, 24-11, Texas 26-9. Actually, a eight-point underdog were the Louisville Cardinals. And, well, Vegas was not correct on this one. Beginning in the second quarter, the Cardinals were able to open up a lead, and they did not look back. The most complete performance of the season was an absolute demolition in the Moody Center against the Longhorns, 73-51. to Haley Van Lith, a game-high 21 points. She has scored over 20 points in six of her last seven NCAA tournament games, dating back to the NCAA tournament last season. Um Fantastic um, performance from Haley. Uh, last game was very efficient against Drake. This time, over 50% from the field, 8 of 15 from the field, 1 of 4 from deep, 4 of 6 from the free throw line, 21 points. Uh, she was one of two Cardinals in double figures, along with Morgan Jones, who was a perfect 5 for 5 in 16 minutes, had 6 rebounds to go along with that, which was solid to see Morgan Jones build that confidence up. Um Within the first 10 minutes or so of the game and heading into the first, the end of the first half, nine Cardinals had found their way onto the score sheet, which we talked about that, uh, you know, that deviation of scoring outside of Haley Van Lith and the Cardinals definitely um, had a lot of players contributing in that mix. Only 22% from the three point line. Or I'm sorry, 23% from the three point line. Uh, they were three at 13, shot 47% uh, from the field. But uh, Texas, even worse, 35% from the field. One of 10 from the three point line, 60% from the free throw line. Um, you look at what the um, Cardinals were able to do defensively and taking care of the basketball. Now they turned the ball over 10 times, but Texas was one of the best teams in the country coming into this game and turning the, or forcing opponents to turn the basketball over. And Louisville was able to, I mean, at, at times they made some mistakes, which every team does. They struggled here and there with that full court press in the second half, but were able to break it more times than not. Uh, defensively speaking, forced 13 turnovers and um, allowed Texas to only five, excuse me, only five assists. So um, really made the game extremely, um, you know, extremely tough for the Longhorns. Get this. This is something that was very interesting. What was largest lead in this game was 27 points. Texas's largest lead in this game was zero. Truly dominant performance from Jeff Walls' squad. The home team did not have one single lead. Uh, Louisville opened up the scoring on a little bit of a run. Texas finally tied the game at 16, and uh, the Cardinals were pushing the lead out um, until the final whistle. So, um, like I said, what a great... Time to have the best performance of the season. Um, you know, the message that Jeff Walls preached after the game against Drake was that the defense needed to be better. Um, Drake really exposed the Cardinals in a couple ways defensively, and they responded with an absolute gem of a performance defensively against Texas and then offensively. I mean, they did what needed to be done. It wasn't the most fantastic shooting percentage, especially from behind the arc. But you see the amount of players that scored at least five points. I mean, four of the starters scored over seven. Olivia Cochran had seven. Haley obviously had 21. Mikasa Robinson and Chris Lynn Carr both had nine. Uh, Morgan Jones had 10. Josie Williams had a very clutch five points um, in two sequences. Liz Dixon had five points, 10 rebounds off the bench. Um, three of those were key offensive rebounds. Marissa Russell, five points off the bench as well. So the Cardinals with 25 uh, bench points, which is something to definitely focus on. So the Cardinals now turn their attention and look to extend that momentum on Friday evening as they take on the eight-seeded Mississippi Rebels. Ole Miss defeated the number one-seeded Stanford Cardinal on the road 
So despite not having to play Stanford, and I'm glad that they don't, Louisville still will have their hands full with a solid Ole Miss team that has a ton of momentum. Ole Miss coming into this game uh, 25-8, and eight, beat Gonzaga pretty badly, 71-48, to 48, who um, you know, gave Louisville fits earlier in the season. You look at what Mississippi's done throughout this season, who they've lost to, two-point loss to Utah, 10-point loss to Oklahoma, um, lost two straight games to Alabama and Auburn, um, a double-digit loss to Tennessee, lost to LSU by nine. They beat Kentucky by 22, uh, lost to South Carolina by 29, and then by se- or by seven, and then by 29. So this is not going to be an easy um, you know, game for the Cardinals. Um, Angel Baker, 15 points per game. You have Madison Scott and Marquisha Davis, who both average over, over double figures as well. So uh, despite being an eight seed, this still is going to be a tough matchup for the Cardinals. Sweet 16 matchup time TBD, but Friday evening up in Seattle. So that's going to con- that's going to conclude today's episode of the show. Thanks for making Locked On Louisville your first to listen every day. For your second listen, check out our brand new podcast, Locked On College Basketball, which you can find on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. But everyone have a great day. We'll see you right back here very soon.